This short code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at MedEdMedia.com. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Code Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcoat.com. Welcome back to the Short Coat Podcast, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler. On today's show, we're talking about penises, probably, with me in the studio to help me with that. It's MD, PhD student, Aline Sanduk. Hey, everybody. M4, Zach Tully is here. Hey, everyone. M3, Mason LaMarche? Yeah, yeah, M3. Oh, okay, he's with us. AJ Chowdhury, host of the podcast Behind the Retractor, joins us from our Washington, D.C. bureau from the Hello. internet. There he is. But we can't just talk about the male member and its associated bits by ourselves. No, <laughs> we are, in fact, joined by Carver College of Medicine clinical assistant, Professor of Urology and Men's Health Program Director, Dr. Amy Perlman. Uh, Dr. Perlman, welcome to the show. Thank you. Raise the roof. All right. <laughs> hey, uh, She said raise the roof. <laughs> oh, is that what we're... Yeah. Oh, oh. That's right. I'm not near... AJ, she said our evals depend on it. So just raise the roof. <laughs> <laughs> Already did my four-weeker. Huh? That's right. <laughs> uh, Dr. Perlman, when my boss's boss's boss, Dr. Chris Cooper, Dean Chris Cooper, also a urologist, uh, learned that you'd be on the show this week, he laughed... And, in, and assured me that I wouldn't have any trouble getting you to talk about men's health. I get the impression from him and from Aline and AJ, both of whom tell me they've spent some extended time with you, that you're pretty passionate about your specialty. Mm-hmm. What 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 drew you to urology? Yeah, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how my parents are proud of me. I was deciding between emergency medicine, pediatrics, and urology, and they really encouraged my decision to do urology, which I thought was interesting because my dad sees a urologist, so it wasn't like he thought it was anything other than what it was. <laughs> yeah, um, he, he knew what you were getting into. He knew what I was getting into. And I think now, you know, I talk about erections and orgasms and all of those things, and I did a webinar last week, and my mother was in town and I had my mom on the webinar Nice. and you know, she sat down next to me and I said, oh, she mom, was with you on camera. She was with me nice. on camera. I said, I need you to be my Vanna white tonight. And so I said, mom, you see that penis on that credenza? I need you to grab that for me, put it up to the camera. <laughs> I showed how to use vacuum pumps and injection therapy. And you know what? She was so happy to be a part of it. And well, who wouldn't? And be, she really? was so happy. And then afterwards, she was like, "Amy, I need that recording. I need to show your dad. We need to get this out there." <laughs> you know. And I think at first, you know, my I need message, to show all my friends <laughs> at water water <laughs> exercise class. You know, my message for my mother sitting next to me when I'm talking about erections is, "Let's get comfortable. Like, get your mom, get your dad, get your child, whatever. But you can you can talk about it in a way that's like." It's just part of your anatomy. It's your penis, just like it's your, you know, your stomach and and your leg. And when you talk about it in medical terms and you distill it to what it is, which is basically a sponge that gets filled up with fluid, it's really hard to offend someone when you use those terms. Okay. I know you're big into uh, public education. In fact, you're... But I didn't. I don't think I answered your question about why I'm passionate about what I do. Apparently, I don't care about <laughs> well, the answer did, to my but question. You did actually. Yeah, you like <laughs> it so much. You'll talk about it with your mom I, for I all like of us. I like it because so many people want to hear about it. Because my work is basically my life, and and so I can talk about my work outside of work, and it's relevant to not only men but everyone because everyone it affects everyone yeah. or it can in some way, shape, or form, and so that makes it really fun. Yeah, so I know you're big into public education. In fact, you're pretty active on uh, on Twitter and and other platforms. What mm-hmm. other what other platforms are you? I'm getting into Instagram, but and the way that I and I use each of these different platforms a little bit differently. A little bit into TikTok, biggest on Twitter, post on Facebook, a YouTube. I use a lot as well. And uh, so you're doing this because it allows you to reach a bunch of people that you wouldn't ordinarily get to reach, right? Yeah, because it has been my answer to burnout. Oh, okay. And and we're always talking about burnout. And, the, you know, the question is when you run a busy surgical clinic, like why do I want to lay in fetal position at the end of the day? It's because, you know, everyone has their own story, but it's all in the same book. Meaning my patients are asking the same question, just 30 different ways. 
And we can't expect our patients to remember everything that we say and do what we tell them to do if we're just verbalizing that information in the office. So what do we say when they come back three months later and we ask them, you know, did they do the five things we told them to do? And they probably forgot most of it or they did. Or we ask them, well, what happened last time we, you know, you were here and they, they say, I don't know. What do we call them? A poor historian. Like, that's bullshit. They're not a poor historian. If I took my car in to get fixed and the mechanic told me what was wrong with my car and then I came back three months later to get an oil change and they said, well, do you have any questions about your last visit? Like, did you do the five things I told you to do? I'd be like, I don't even know. Like, how many axles do I have? (laughs) And that's a really dumb question, but that is not my life. You know, no one ever sat me down to teach me about my car. And so the educational material that I do allows me to sit in front of someone like Bill to say, Bill, no one's ever talked to you about your body before. We're just talking today. So let's talk about your bladder. Let's talk about how that works. Let's talk about your prostate. And there are so many different ways that we can treat any of the things that I do. I mean, there are like 15 different ways that I can shrink a prostate. There are like 15 different ways I can treat someone's erectile dysfunction. So you can't teach someone the basics of their body and ask them to make a decision about what to do about it in a single visit. It's just not a fair thing. A lot of information. Yeah. So my, and you see the eyes glaze over and then you talk around in circles. So I say, we're just talking today. I don't expect you to make a decision today. I want you to watch some videos that I have online maybe some people have to watch them 10 times before they get what I'm saying and another 10 to, before they decide what to do about it and then we'll talk more send me a message on my chart let me know what you're thinking but I'm not curing cancer I'm treating quality of life concerns so a lot of my patients they don't have to do anything and so that's a decision in and of itself I look for I, two things jumped out at me about that by the way don't let me monopolize the conversation <laughs> or me because I talk a lot two things jumped out about me about jumped out at me about that about what you said which is that it's an answer to a burnout for you and also that you use these videos to educate your your patients so as they come in and they want to learn about their bodies and and how they work you can refer them to videos fantastic both of those are fantastic uses of both social media and video so yeah. pretty cool mm-hmm. I, I started this podcast 10 years ago because I was bored with my job and I can so I can I feel like I can relate to this I don't know if that I was burnt out but I was just like okay I got this yeah well you know, and it like, allows what you else, to be what can more I creative yeah and it's so fun to be able to be creative yeah, yeah. It, the thought that came to me exactly about the burnout and then the social media is innovative mm. you've come up with a really unique way to address your patient to be a better doctor and to really improve their and, and also like be a healthier doctor yourself which mm-hmm. is really nice mm-hmm. and it allows to for it, when the person goes home and let's say they watch the video and i know that whoever you know the family member is going to ask what did you discuss today and so instead of ha- you know then the, them calling the office and necessarily you know having to come in for a visit they can watch a video and it's my message my message is consistent on twitter and it's consistent on instagram and it's consistent on youtube and what patients don't understand is like if they read a written material or they see something online even one sentence that might be a different recommendation from what they hear they get confused and they don't know Actually, if so going true. off that recommendation is going Going to kill them. That is you actually know, it's like so true. You take a true. medication. They say take it with or without food, and you're like, or with or without without alcohol, and you're like, but what happens if I take it and I drank a couple hours ago? Yeah. Like, am I going to die? Like, what's yeah. the real deal there? So patients don't know what's really important and what's not. So all it takes is one slight uh, difference in the message where they get confused, and so mm-hmm. I want to control that message because I say it in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Or. You hear a different message and you're and you're like, okay, well, which one you you sort of make this almost unconscious decision. Which one will I enjoy following more or will I hate following (laughs) less? You're taking bets, really. (laughs) And you choose the one that's like easiest. I want to do what the doctor told me, but I'm betting this way is going to be way more fun. So I'm going to do that (laughs) instead. Yeah. And then, you know, if they're watching the videos at home and let's say the wife is like, hey, what are you watching? Then I don't know. Maybe Bill can say, I don't know. I just saw this this video online. I was going to check it out. And then I can say those scary terms for Bill that Bill doesn't have to verbalize to his wife. So I can say the word penis and erection. And I can say in the video, hey, you know, it's not the woman's fault. Your partner may still be attracted to you. It's a blood vessel problem. It's a diabetes problem and a nerve problem. And they're going to believe me more than they're going to believe their partner. And that's just the reality. Because Bill's a liar. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) 
But Bill no, no. doesn't know how to tell his partner that it's not her, it's me. Yeah. What I think is cool about this too is like every part of like being a physician, like there's very individualized advice you provide, mm-hmm. but you're right. There's, you know, we see as med students with attendings, there's certain scripts that you fall into because there's many stories that are telling the, you know, the same final conclusion. So I think this allows you to control your message and really think about what you're doing and update it, you know, if evidence mm-hmm. changes. So I, I see it being a benefit for you, for patients, but also like a, a system wide thing that if more people got involved with this type of outreach, uh, be a lot of positive I yeah. think, effects. You're absolutely right. And there's so much misinformation out there. There's so much misinformation. So what research suggests when it comes to building one's digital footprint is one, patients will choose their providers based on whether or not their provider has something online. So that is hands down in, in the research. The other thing too, is there's so much misinformation out there that if we expect our patients to gump come in with some type of knowledge we can't just say oh you looked at dr google well unless we give them some other information to look at of course they're going to go to google all of us go to google in fact when my patients come in and they say i looked up this up online i you know don't don't hate me i looked at google i'm like thank you that is phenomenal you because now you understand the basics and you understand you at least understand enough where you know what questions to ask when our patients don't understand what their problem is, when at the end of the visit, when you say, Bob, what questions do you have for me? And Bob says, I don't have any questions. Bob didn't get, didn't understand a word that I just told him. Yeah. A word. If I schedule yeah. someone for surgery and I go through the consent and I say, what questions do you have for me? And they say, I don't have any. They don't understand what I'm about to do. To them. <laughs> they don't because everyone has questions. I worry about the people who don't have questions. My, my questions usually come up about an hour after the visit is over because I'm really slow at thinking about it. <laughs> it's a pretty complex <laughs> issue a lot of times, too. Do you have any, like, issues getting things to, like, I've heard recommendations of, like, an 8th grade or 10th grade reading level on some of your materials. Do you have any difficulty kind of, like, bringing it to that level or reducing the amount of syntax mm-hmm. and syllables and things like that in providing patient information? Yeah, and that's a really good point because there are services through universities where you can get it, you know, it, to make sure that it's at the appropriate level. I have so much educational material. I have they have to bring out a whole metal table when I'm there in clinic. I have my demos on the table because I'm not going to talk about a vacuum pump without showing my patient this is what a vacuum pump is. Mm-hmm. This is what the needle is. It, this is the exact needle you're going to put in your penis if you decide to go that route. And I probably have 50 documents of patient educational material. And it's not just about you know erections, although that uh, that is a lot of the education I provide. It's on, hey, if I send you for an at-home sleep study, this is what to expect. Here's the brochure. If I'm you know advising that you check out Quitline Iowa, I'm going to give you the Quitline Iowa brochure. If, if, you know, someone's coming in that's overweight, who's a candidate for bariatric surgery, I'm going to give them the surgery that bariatrics requires so I can start them along that process. So I have a lot of educational material and I don't have the bandwidth to get everything approved. And so I, I create these forms and then if my patients give me feedback and they say, and most of the time they're giving me feedback on my videos and I have a few key patients of mine who are super engaged. They attend all my webinars and they say, uh, this is where I think you can improve. And this is what I liked about your last webinar. And you spoke way too quickly and get rid of the PowerPoint. And so that's where the videos I can change in real time, how I do it next time. And I listen to my patients and they are the ones uh, that dictate how I do it in the future. I would say the written material, I, I change less often, but the videos, I can change that all the time based on feedback. It's really good to have that constant feedback, Mm -hmm. too. That's a nice resource. Yeah. You know, the other thing, too, that I don't think a lot of people realize is there's a lot of good content already online. We don't have to do it all ourselves, right? We think that we do, and that can be overwhelming. And that's why a lot of people don't even start. But through a lot of foundations, you know, like the Urology Foundation and and, and AUA, Urology Foundation is an AUA foundation, but you can go on there and they have all these brochures in like 15 different languages on erectile dysfunction. So if we have patients who, you know, are commonly in our offices who speak other languages, we, we don't have to create that content. It's a lot of it's online for a lot of different conditions. We just have to know what where those sites are. And so for a lot of what I do and what other people can do is just find the reliable sources, put it down on a piece of paper and give your patients a piece of paper to say, you know, I this is my content, but here's some other really good websites you can go to. But a part of our job as healthcare providers is to vet that information for our patients because there's so much information out there that it's helpful for us to say, this is a reliable site and this is not. That brings up a question for me. Do you feel like having all this public education material out for your patients and 
educating them in the clinic with the actual materials that they would be using and providing them with all these brochures, has that affected your efficiency in clinic? Because that seems to be one of the mm -hmm. things that uh, becomes a concern for providers as they want to sit down and talk to their patients, but they don't have time. Then they have 20 more patients to see in an eight hour day. Yeah, it absolutely has. I mean, I still run behind one or two hours usually because I like to talk and so do my patients. But, you know, it allows it before I used to feel like I had to go through every single option for something like erectile dysfunction. And now I, I go through the one that I'm going to start the patient on and then I'll give a packet and I'll say this packet goes through all the different options, the pros, the possible side effects and the take home message. And that take home message is something that I've curated. It's a couple sentences long for each therapy. And it's like the real deal. And I tell my patients, I don't care what you decide to do. I literally could not care less. My goal is to meet your quality of life goals. And however we do that, I'm fine with it. And so that that take home message is just like, what are the cost considerations? What do people like? You know, what's my opinion? But most importantly, what do my patients tell me about those products, you know, and those different therapies? But I don't have to go through every single therapy in depth, AJ. I can I can give them that packet and say, when you go home, why don't you go through this packet and learn some more information? I, here are my you I give them a sheet of paper with all my social media handles on it, with all my with the YouTube link. And I say, check out these videos. I do monthly webinars through the University of Iowa. And I say every Tuesday, every, the first Tuesday of every month, join a webinar. There's Q&A. So, you know, those webinars and that educational material too allows, you know, my access isn't great into my clinic because I only have clinic once a week. So, you know, if a new patient calls in, they'll probably get an appointment for three months from now, which I don't like. I don't like that a patient has to wait three months. But what someone can say to that patient, like from scheduling or my secretary is, between now and then, you have this opportunity to meet your doctor on several occasions. You have, you know, a few opportunities to hop on our webinar. In real time, you can ask your questions. So it's your concerns are very important. And so we're giving you that opportunity to interact beforehand. And I think that's an answer to access issues that's into our huge. healthcare system. Yep. You know, if, if it takes a while to get into medical weight management or endocrinology or orthopedics, well, then engage with them ahead of time. And you can do that through social media. And it's another way where patients will feel like they've met you before because they've seen your face. They've heard you talk about these concerns. And I think that's another way if you're only in the office for five minutes, when you go home, you're going to see some more of me. Mm -hmm. That's big because it's so frustrating from a patient's point of view, I can tell you, to need something and to have to wait weeks or months mm -hmm. to get it. Yeah, so cool. So yeah. cool. It also looks like it serves a dual benefit both for the patients and for you. Going back to the efficiency thing in clinic, it seems like even if you spend an hour or two extra in clinic now, all the other aspects of your career are also being boosted by this. Your your branding, your market presence, your academic standing and popularity within the department or whatever academic circles you're in, that they all seem to be uh, rapidly improving along with improved patient care and actually being able to talk to your patients and inform them. Yeah. You know, everything is related. I, I was talking to the summer research fellowship students yesterday on collaboration and so much of what I've been able to do online has helped with collaborative research efforts. So now, you know, now when you think about who you want to collaborate with as a student, you're not confined by the walls of the university. And you don't necessarily need a faculty member to support you. You can literally contact anyone around the world if you have a research question to find someone to work with. And you don't even need their email. Find them on Twitter, send them a tweet, you know, a private message. I've had, it's another way to network with community members who have research questions. And I had one recently send me, you know, a Twitter message and said, I have some funding. And so if you think you can come up with a team with maybe a basic scientist, I have funding and That's he's a guy awesome. who's looking for some help, you know, and he's he's on the East Coast. So now there's really no excuse to even network or get mentorship or collaborate with research or people in the community because you can do that. When I when I see a patient in the office, this was a couple of weeks ago, it was it was post orgasmic illness syndrome. A, a guy had come in with those concerns, which I couldn't find much online in terms of, you know, case reports. So I went to Twitter and, you know, it was all HIPAA compliance. But I said, you know, a 24 year old man came to see me today. These are his concerns. I need some help here, folks. And I, I tagged a few of my sexual medicine colleagues. And within minutes, I had private messages saying, this is what I've tried. You know, why don't you consider this? And now we have a research project going on with a basic scientist. And that was based on one person who came in and a tweet that I sent. And in real time, you can actually change the way that you care for patients and start, you know, collaborative projects with people outside of the country. 
That's awesome. That's that's really nice. We're just I mean, the opportunities are endless. <laughs> yeah. You know, for anyone and you don't need a Ph.D. to do it and you don't need an M.D. to do it. And no one is ever just a student. Did you when you first started engaging in this way, in this very public way? Did you have concerns about that? Did the people you work for have concerns about it? Or was it just like, no, I'm going to, I don't care. I'm yeah. going to do this. Because, I mean, I, I guess one thing that I think about sometimes is in the age of internet outrage, you know, what if I screw it up? I mean, obviously you're going to talk about evidence-based stuff and, you know, not be a complete crazy person. But, you know, there's a chance. <laughs> there's a chance. Actually, I have a related question about that. <laughs> About crazy people, or <laughs> <laughs> what specifically, AJ? Um, with making videos and putting them up on YouTube, tweeting information to help your patients out, do you feel like there's going to be a long-term investment that will be worth it for, you know, maybe there will be a new therapy that comes out that replaces uh, a lot of the information that you've already put out, or maybe something turns out to not be uh, truly evidence-based, do you feel like it's worth it to what's the right word to to Go. correct yourself and put out new material to replace that yeah always and it makes it easy to do it and you don't need to publish a manuscript to update information yeah. you can send out you know a tweet or something on facebook or youtube to say hey this is the updated evidence and it doesn't have to be published to do that you know, whereas back in the day, like to get updated information, you couldn't go on Twitter to see things. You had to wait until it was in print so you can make decisions and, and change the way you educate in much more of a real time scenario. In terms of being active on social media, it requires this acknowledgement of the vulnerability that is inherent in doing so. And and so I've acknowledged that it puts me in a somewhat vulnerable place with most of the stuff that I post. I think a lot of people like it. I think there are probably some who may find it annoying. I, I have a new puppy, so I post some puppy stuff on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. And I think she's so push adorable. You gotta but, post your pets. But it's like, but most people don't care about seeing her pictures. Mm -hmm. And then maybe some people hate it. The reality is most people didn't don't care. They don't care. You know, we all post stuff and they, they you can just scroll through if mm -hmm. you don't like it. And I am okay with people reacting in any one of those ways. I got on Twitter about two years ago we had our big national meeting from the American Urological Association and Boston Scientific um, had asked me to tweet about something. It was like tweeting a question about penile implants. Hmm. And so I had to I had to create a Twitter account. And that's what initially got me on Twitter. But boy, did I hate Twitter for about two years. I thought it was incredibly annoying. Yeah. And then I don't know, I think I just started working with it a little bit more. And now it has changed the way I treat patients. I collaborate with other people in the scientific community and I do research. So I think there are some people who use social media very poorly. And when you post polarizing comments, you will get polarizing responses. And most of the stuff that I post is just for education. It is supportive of my collaborators and I'm trying to make other people look good. And so I haven't had any mean comments, but it's because of the things that I post. Yeah. yeah when you're, I, I don't know where I heard the saying, but I really love it. When your path has heart, you can't go wrong. If you're doing things for the right reasons, people can't and usually don't get mad at you. And like it, your intent is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. I think in your videos, you're not trolling. Mm -hmm. You're not, you know, trying to send a political message. It's very clear that like, I care about my patients and I want them to have better lives and I'm willing to put myself out there to do that. Mm -hmm. so. And don't feed yeah. the trolls. <laughs> don't feed the trolls. Yeah. Don't feed the trolls. I, I posted the video for Marty McCary's interview on YouTube. And I would say within half a second, somebody had posted their lovely theories about well your mistake is everything. you didn't disable the comments i know right? i want the comments you were asking right yeah i no, want the yeah. comments even if they're crazy people because that's interesting to me but also you know helps with the algorithm a little bit but <laughs> right now i'm ready to troll that person <laughs> no, no. <laughs> don't feed the trolls the, you know, the other thing, too, is I know that my patients appreciate the content. And that's who it's for. And that's who it's for. Right. You know, it's for nobody else but my patients, right. you know, for a lot of the things that I post. And I was like, that's cool. Speaking of strange things uh <laughs> i've been reading a lot about a global sperm count crisis and i 
it started coming back again in my in my new news feeds lately and i was like oh great amy's coming <laughs> so if you if listeners if you don't know about this apparently sperm counts have fallen so low that it might constitute a global existential crisis on the other hand the new york times reported this week on research that says that the idea that this is a crisis is flawed <laughs> and most of the concern seems to come from a 2017 meta analysis that found sper- sperm counts have fallen 60% since 1973 in europe north america australia and New Zealand. Do you have a take on this as a fertility <laughs> doctor? <laughs> are um, we are we headed towards a population crash because <laughs> men can't don't have enough sperm? Is you this- know, that's the first time I've actually heard that. I would say though that I've been surprised. This is the first my- time you've heard of this story? Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. It's like okay. We must do different search terms. <laughs> But that wouldn't surprise me. I get a lot of weird stuff. You've got different keywords. I mean, yeah. my, my Facebook is like yoga pants, yoga pants. I'm like, how do they know? I love yoga pants. It's the show that does it to me. Dave's is just sperm yeah. over and over. Yeah. <laughs> it's the show that does it to me. I swear to God. Yeah, yeah. Big it's the show. Oh, I get what it is. so okay. much, so much uh, medical stuff. <laughs> but, so what I do see a lot in my office these guys coming in with legitimately low, legitimately low testosterone levels. And testosterone is really important for to be able to have babies. And and I I'm surprised because I didn't I mean obviously I'm seeing all these patients now so during training I wasn't in clinic as much, but I see healthy men who are you know, exercise who don't look the part of having low testosterone, who really have low testosterone levels. And I suspect it has a lot to do with what we're eating and environmental factors. And and so I'm not surprised if sperm counts are going down. But I think a lot of it has to do with our overall health and overall obesity is going up. And that's incredibly tied to our hormones and our fertility. Yeah. Among the things that among the problems that this article, just so you know, <laughs> educate me. Break. Yes. <laughs> I. Dave Etler, the Administrative <laughs> Services Coordinator of the Writing and Humanities Program at the Carver College of Medicine, will now educate Amy Perlman. Local expert on sperm. Yes. <laughs> Self-proclaimed Yeah, you'll have to add that yeah. to your uh, your email it, signature. Consider it, <laughs> consider it done. Okay. <laughs> now that is going too far. Um, data collected was geographically sparse. Lacked basic info like the age of the men tested. Takes for granted that sperm count is actually a valid measure of male fertility and overall health when that isn't clear that that's true. So, you know, there you go. And there's so much, you know, research that's out there that's on these big data sets where we really can't provide any good information. And so a lot of those things are hypo- or bring up good hypotheses, but they don't actually answer any questions. But but people love reading that information, oh. so they they make the headlines. Oh yeah, when there's no good research behind it. Yeah, I'm sure when some journalist first broke the story, they were super psyched. Yeah, because mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's a, it's a very sexy headline, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, like I got scared when you said that, <laughs> yeah. right? But then you look at the data and you're like, well, they way overinterpreted that. So. But also, and part of me is like, yeah, well, we could use a good population crash. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's just. Um, I mean, certain people, though. No. no well, no, I mean, you know, the, 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 the. We're going to get some comments. No, 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 no. Look, you the, might want to turn those The off. great part of this is that it's not people dying. It's people failing to come into existence in the first place. Oh. Failing to pr- propagate is what right, we're talking about. Yes. Right. Yeah. We are going to get some comments. We need to be careful. Bring people it on. Do, people do I listen some, to this. I want some controversy, baby. Dave wants another bubonic plague. That's like, right. <laughs> no, I do not. I've had enough. But only in people balls apparent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, when you're working with students, do you have any coaching on how to be chill during a genital exam? How to be How what? to be chill. Oh, how to be chill. cool. Chill. I do. I do. So like, for example, yesterday in clinic, I had a student with me and I'll show the person how to do the exam, you know, before I have them do it. And I go through everything. On, and I'll make on sure. On a model, I assume. You know, what? On a model. No, no, on a patient. Oh, on a patient. On a patient. Okay. We just don't have really good models to show how to do the exam. And and my clinics are are full of men. So, but I'm going to choose the appropriate ones. So at the end of the day, I'm not going to risk my relationship with a patient because a student has to do a genital exam. You know, it's like, we'll save that for another day. 
but you know, for the appropriate patient, I'll, I'll have them stand up. I sit down on a stool so that I'm eye level and I explain everything that I'm doing. And, and I'm explaining it to the patient because nobody ever told the dude that his glands was normal and he doesn't have any scar tissue in his penis and his testicle is normal. So I'm explaining it to everyone in the room, both the patient and the student. And then for the, when there's, you know, a, a patient where I don't think they're going to have a problem, I'll say, Hey, do you mind if, you know, my medical student today does the exam as well? And, and because I've asked patients who, who I have a sense that they're going to say yes, no one has said no, that would make me uncomfortable. And then I just, I scooch over, I have the student, you know, stand there and then I'll give them, you know, real time feedback. I think people are afraid of the penis. It's, well, that's, it's what, little, I was, that's it, what I was kind of getting yeah, at. People are, are so afraid of it. And guys do a lot with their penises. So I have to like in uh, stir my coffee with mine. (laughs) (laughs) In in a sensitive way, I have to tell the person you're not going to hurt it. Like you, you can, you can touch it. You can pull it. You can, you know, pull the skin back. You can like open up the urethra, make sure there's nothing there. You know, don't, you don't have to like grab uh, the testicles. Just, you know, you're feeling for anything grossly abnormal. Please don't. But yeah, I I find that people are, they kind of (laughs) like, <laughs> and like, very and delicate. It like hurts it. me a little bit to watch that because I think we're all just like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you're making it sound like the bop it toy, like the twist it, <laughs> bop it, pull it. Ex- yeah, except if you were afraid of breaking the toy, like I'm gonna twist it and <laughs> bop it. <laughs> now I do think, I think it helps because I'm a woman doing this exam. In that if I have another female student in with me, then the person is already used to a female doing the exam. But we can never make assumptions with our patients who they would not be okay with that with doing the exam. Because I've had some patients say, I cannot see a man. And usually it's those guys who have had prior trauma. And so they'll they will very adamant, I can't have anyone in this room who's a man. And we can't take offense to that. It's everyone's preference. You know, I, the guys who make it in to see me in the office, they know that my first name is Amy. So when people say, well, do people, do men have problems seeing a woman? Yeah, some of them do. They don't show up in my office because they choose to see a def- different provider. And I don't get offended by that. I'm grateful that there are people of all different genders who see men for men's health. Mm-hmm. And, and I think part of our job as healthcare providers is to make sure that other people know there are other providers so that they can see someone that they feel comfortable seeing. But I have men who prefer to see women and who prefer to see men, and we just can't ever make those assumptions. Yeah, yeah. It's there's an interesting line between like what what we are able and willing to do to accommodate a patient's comfort and then a place where like, OK, it goes too far, you know, and it's it's hard to figure out where our responsibility lies. Like, as you were talking about that, I was like, that's an easy thing to do, like mm-hmm. everything that you're talking about. And it would be nice if I guess if more, if more providers kind of had that philosophy of like, OK, well, this is not an ideal situation for me to work, but my job is to meet you where you are mm-hmm. and to deliver the care that I need to you know, deliver to you. So mm-hmm. that's a great but, philosophy. And the reality now, though, is people can they can go to different doctors and healthcare providers and advanced practice providers. And that's a beautiful thing that they can choose. I mean, I, I for I mean, in what part of our lives do we accept the only like do we only go to hy V? I I mean, I love hy V, but sometimes I go to other grocery stores and that's okay. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing with providers. But that's where I think the social media and online presence is another answer. Is, is patients and or potential patients can watch the content beforehand. I have a video. It's a 26 minute video and it goes through what does a typical visit look like with me? What are the questions that I ask? And then that way they can be prepared with those answers before they come in. I have a demo model of a penis and I show them the exam. And so and I show them all the treatment options. So if they watch that video and they're like, eh, she's a little weird. I'm not really feeling her vibe. Then they can schedule with someone else and they know that information beforehand. Mm-hmm. Or someone who might not want to see woman. Maybe they saw the video and they're like, hell yeah, I want to see her. And I think that happens too. You know, what you're touching on is the fact that like the chasm between like what information patients are coming in with and what information providers are coming in with. And the fact that you have five minutes and so much happens in that five minutes and so much information. Like there's a reason that charts are so and medical notes are so difficult to read is because like that realty is so precious and every word counts and every word conveys so much information so that like 
I'm not, you know, HIPAA is an important law to have, but also like who could interpret these things if they weren't medical professionals, you know? Mm -hmm. But what I love is that you're, you're setting your patients up for success. Mm -hmm. You're giving them all the information that they need so that when they come in, there's no surprises. They're not shocked. They're not caught off guard. It's safe. You've mm -hmm. made it really comfortable and safe for them. So that's awesome. Like if I walked into an office, to a gynecology office, and a young man was like, okay, get your bottoms down. I'd be like, what? <laughs> Yeah. Like I would I might walk out. Yeah. So to be surprised I can, with to that. To be surprised, you know? Yeah. you know. So I can appreciate that there are a lot of men who walk in and I come in clanking and clacking with my heels, you know, <laughs> that are snakeskin heels and in my snoot in my suit. And I can appreciate that some men might be taken off guard by that. And so mm -hmm. I, I want them to be prepared ahead of time. Yeah, and I think it a real ace in your pocket is that you you seem very hard to offend and I think that's really important because like it, it wouldn't be hard for someone to take that personally and be like mm -hmm. well there's nothing wrong with me but like they're not commenting on your ability it really just says something about their life or the, their experiences that we don't need to know yeah. it's just this is what they prefer hey that's okay yeah. yeah and and whether it's the age of the doctor you know or or whatever it is it does it's not even just like a male female thing you know so yeah. if I were to schedule with a gynecologist and they were to say, do you have a preference on seeing a, a man or a woman? And if I said a woman and any male male gynecologists were offended by that, I'd say, get over it. It's not about you. you exactly, know? exactly. And, and I think that's what we have to realize. So for a lot of what I do, I, I give a lot of talks on what it means to be a woman in men's health. And so, and so I use that to my advantage when it is my advantage. But most of the time I say, I'm a men's health specialist, I'm a urologist, and I happen to be a woman. And so for a lot of these conversations that I have, too, where we have these insight meetings and advisory boards, you know, every all the women are sitting at the conference room table. We're talking about how women are better. And then you look at the perimeter and it's a bunch of dudes. So we can't mm. give that message that we're better. I have somewhat of a problem with the future is female because it's like, no, the future is all of us. The future is and equal. The, we all play a role in healthcare and in life. And yeah. we can't just promote one gender in that message. Yeah. An interesting conversation I was having with my best friend recently was that this phenomenon of mansplaining. And like I I've been mansplained. I am aware of what it sounds like, what it looks like, but not every man explaining something is mansplaining. <laughs> like sometimes men do a man does know better or something about I that I don't know and, and I well, need Well actually Aline. <laughs> Sorry, that's unacceptable. So that was, oh, that's enough, Dave. I'm caught off guard. Gotta really emphasize the well, actually. <laughs> Don't forget to call me little girl or sweetheart or honey. You know, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. There's, there's a, there's a line. Yeah, and I see what people are saying when they say, you know, the they're asking for equality, but that's not how they're framing it. And like ultimately, that is what you you. I can't say it any better than you did. Like the future is all of us working together. Mm -hmm. So, so Zach, you've done your urology rotation. Was there anything that surprised you during, you know, your four weeks? The scope of what urology really consists of. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it. Almost everything in surgery and everything in medicine, urology kind of touches on mm -hmm. like microsurgery, large open surgeries, endoscopic procedures. It's really just blew my mind. It's that, not all about the penis. It's not all about, it's the, all penis. about the penis, but it's not all about the yeah, penis. There's a lot of other parts. <laughs> I actually saw very few surgeries on the penis itself <laughs> relative to how much I thought penises were involved. But yeah. Yeah. So. Prostates. Prostates are big. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Prostates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> So is that a yes then to urology or oh, no? Oh yeah, or... I'm in. Yeah, I'm all in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's, truly? He's balls yeah. to the wall. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm on my urology research block. Just waiting for that one. <laughs> you know, I I'm so I'm so discombobulated right now because usually I'm the one that makes those jokes and I I feel supplanted by I've been bested <laughs> by faculty no less. No, that's awesome. It's true. So the question that's been on my mind kind of this whole mm -hmm. conversation is, did you, is, has there been a role model in your life that you saw kind of, you know, behaving this in this way or having these philosophies as a provider and said, oh, I want to be more like that? Or did it just like organically develop as you were progressing in your career? I, I look at a lot of people as as mentors, and that's what I encourage of every student is don't just find one mentor, find a mentor to help you with research and maybe a couple to help you with research and another one who can help you with your public speaking skills. And 
So with what I'm doing now, I look at who's doing it well and I figure out what is their message? What is their brand? And how might mine be similar or different? And there are a lot of people who do it really well. And there, especially, you know, in neurology, there, you know, are a few key people who do it well. So I look at their videos and I'm like, and you have to figure out your brand and sort of define that. And it's never too early to do that. In fact, each of you should figure out like, what is your brand? Because you can even start educating and creating your brand online now and you don't need an MD to do that. In fact, now with, you know, with applying for residencies, you know, if someone is not on Twitter and they're applying for residency, they're behind. Because Uh-oh. we as programs are putting all of our information out there. We are putting oh, everything wow. out there. We're putting, yeah. are we doing virtual, you know, webinars on our program? What research is going on? So whereas with a website, especially through a university, that doesn't get updated in real time. Maybe yeah. it gets updated, you know, once a year. But yeah. now with the with programs and, and a lot of them, you know, have their own Twitter pages is that gets updated every day or a few times a week. And so you can figure out well, how, if I want to know, is this program really productive with research? Look at their Twitter. Are they posting, you know, manuscripts that are coming out of their program? Yeah. And, and you can also find out a lot about the faculty members. So, and it can take time to prepare, especially if you're interviewing at a lot of places. And now's the time to prepare for that. So if you have your 20 schools that you're going to apply to, print out packets of their websites with all the faculty members and residents. And then as you are going about your day and things come up on Twitter and you see one of the faculty members, you see what interests them. Wow, we're giving you all the secrets. We're giving you, when when you say, well, what questions do you have? What an opportunity if you were recently on their Facebook page or, or you know, Twitter page to say, hey, I saw that you recently published this article and this is, you know, a question that I had about some of the work that you do. And that's flattering for us, mm-hmm. you know? And so if, if, if we ask these questions, if I'm interviewing and I say, what questions do you have specifically about our program? And again, if they don't have any questions, they don't do their research. And, and that's like, that's, if they can't, kind of follow and stay up to date with some of the stuff that we're putting out. I mean, how, how, e- how much easier can we make it, yeah. you know? And, and so I think every applicant should be on Twitter because all the information is on there in real time. Also, we see your name. So it is an opportunity to network. It is an opportunity, yeah. you know, I mean, if I see that, you know, an, a person who is, is liking my, the things that I'm posting and then might be commenting and, and whatever, that name gets stuck somewhere in my brain. And we all notice that. We see who's liking our stuff and who's commenting. Yeah. And so if I'm going to be interviewing someone, I already feel like I know that person. So it's just another way to get your name out there to programs. So just stalk like whatever urology programs I want yeah, to apply absolutely. to. Okay. That's, absolutely. that's exactly like everything. And, yeah. And, and start doing it now because okay. it takes time and write it down. Because all you have to say is one comment like Perlman has a dog. Okay. So then, you know, if they say, well, what are your hobbies? Like if you have a dog, you might want to bring that up because then we're going to go off script and get into a good conversation about how I'm a terrible trainer of my dog and she poops and pees everywhere this morning my god i woke up there was toilet paper ripped up all over the floor what kind of dog do you have i saw i remember seeing it. but but that that is those are the conversations you want when you're interviewing right yeah, yeah you that's, know I, this is what i've heard is is you know like you say the times when you go off script is actually the most productive interview moments for residency applications i've heard this over and over and over again in in the context of the podcast for instance you know i often hear from from people who had applied you know yeah. students who had applied oh, we yeah. talked a lot about the podcast yeah which is great yeah it's way more fun and then you can see how the program is actually engaging several months before your interview you know and especially with virtual interviews you can see like all right how supportive is this program of its residents what are they posting are they mm. you know posting articles that their residents are, are publishing and saying good comments about it are they not doing that yeah Note to self, slide in my doctor's DMs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've I've developed incredible mentor-mentee relationships with people who have sent me DMs on Twitter. And so when whenever anyone does that, I say, let's set up a Zoom call. And we Zoom on a weekend, and I better understand what their goals are and have, have mentored you know students on research projects who are at other programs who may not have home programs. And I think those are the students who really can benefit. If they don't have a home urology program, they're not they have a harder time, yeah. you know, so they can reach out to other urologists. I need to jump in and take a break here. Our sponsor this week, once again, Panacea Financial, a company founded by two doctors that were frustrated as medical trainees that banks didn't seem to understand the needs of those in the medical field. They built a company just for medical students and doctors with nationwide digital banking, 
Panacea Financial provides medical students with free checking, that includes no ATM fees nationwide, high yield savings accounts, uh, free personal banker, around the clock customer support, and with loans designed with you in mind. No one should borrow more than they need, but with Panacea Financial, fourth year medical students can get money as needed in as little as 24 hours with their PRN personal loan. It has an interest rate a half of a usual credit card, no co-signer requirement, and it's a fully digital application. Instead of running up credit card debt, try their PRN personal loan that is designed to give you a better way to cover expenses, such as residency applications and relocation or board exams. Some customers use it to pay off toxic credit card debt, and medical students can have a period of no or reduced payments on their PRN personal loan. So join the growing number of medical students and physicians nationwide that expect more from their bank. Go to panaceafinancial.com to open your free account. Panacea Financial is a division of premise member FDIC. Thank you, Panacea Financial, for your support. I have a question from our live stream on Facebook. What, this is from Hannah, what do you guys think about the complaints I've heard from some male medical students about feeling rejected by or left out of their OB-GYN rotations mm -hmm. because of many female patients' wishes to have only females? How do we address those who feel their education or training is lacking due to missed experiences? So I think it's like, uh, so done the B rotation have been excluded from those. And at that time, I, I kind of have the same thought, like it's not about me. And I understand that for people, particularly men who are interested in like OB and really would like that experience, that's part of their career that they have to also learn and grow and adjust with. Like they just have to realize like that particular declining of them being involved is not about them. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of like privilege and, you know, being upset about that. And I think it's natural to feel a little upset because there were times where I felt a little hurt, like, oh, you know, they don't know me and maybe they feel more comfortable if they knew me, but that's also like not the point. It's not about <laughs> me. So I, I think it's tough. But the second you reflect on it for one second, I think it becomes a, a bit more selfish. Like it's okay mm -hmm. to feel that way and then, you know, try and move past it or talk with someone to move past it. Mm -hmm. So unfortunate, but not has nothing to do with well, you really. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be forced on a patient. Like right, that should never right. be a surprise. Here's this male med suit just coming in while you are in a very vulnerable, unique mm -hmm. position. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing, too, is much of what you will learn and do in practice is not learned in medical school. Pretty much everything I do now, uh, I learned in fellowship and I've learned since starting as a faculty member. The work that I do with our transgender patient population, I had never seen or treated a transgender patient, you know, in five years of my surgical training. I probably saw two during my fellowship and now I speak, you know, all around Iowa to talk about the care that we provide. Hmm. And I learned that in the last three years mm -hmm. and I learned how to do the exam in the last three years. And now I teach other people how to do the exam. And so a lot of these mm -hmm. exams, they're not hard and we'll get the opportunity and people will get that opportunity. And as students, you're not going to learn a lot of that stuff. That's OK. You know, and even as residents, it's tough because the patients may still be expecting your attending in the room. And so if your gender is different than the attending or your attending is much older and you're much younger and it's just different, they're not expecting it. And so you'll you'll have to warm up to patients for the first few minutes throughout your medical school and your residency training and your fellowship if you do that. And only after that, when you're a faculty member, can you say, well, you scheduled this appointment with me. Here I am, yeah. you know, but that's really going to be the first time where they're expecting to see you. Otherwise, in any of those other circumstances, they're not expecting to see you. Mm -hmm. that's something i think about a lot too with med school is like i think there's this misconception particularly people who don't go to med school that we like are doctors when we're done and sure there's like an md and do after a name but we have no clue how to practice any scope of real medicine like that's what residency and fellowship is for so i like to think of med school as like you are getting a chance to see how you can utilize your colleagues in the future when i'm on a two-week urology i'm getting the best chance to try and understand how i can be a better colleague to my fellow urologist and, you know, realize when I can call on them and when they may need to call on, mm -hmm. you know, call on me. So I think when med students can start framing it as that, it's not like, oh, I need to learn these skills now because I'll never learn them versus mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand how I can work with people. And, you know, in some situations, do I want to do this type of work for the rest mm -hmm. of my life? I think that's like more the central focus of medical education, especially in the undergraduate setting. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, if there's a skill that you didn't get to learn then you find someone who knows how to do it. You call them up or you send them a DM and you say, I'd like to come to your facility and learn how to do it. And I, I again, a lot of the procedures that I do, I never saw in training, yeah. but you reach out to people who do it. You ask to learn. That's what these continuing courses are at different conferences. And then you develop the skill and you know the basics because you learn the basics in, in medical school and residency. So for surgery, for example, once you know the basics of tissue handling, 
then you can pretty much do anything. It's just different tissue. It occurs to me that we talk about medical school and residency on this show an awful lot, but we don't usually talk much about fellowships. Mm-hmm. And you did your fellowship in, I think, North Carolina, mm-hmm. Urologic Reconstruction, Prosthetic Urology, and Infertility, according mm-hmm. to your faculty profile mm-hmm. page. Mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about fellowship training in urology? And, and you know, you, you don't have to do a fellowship, but you wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. And you were, you know, a super student, I guess, to get that fellowship. But what is it, what is it like? What is it about? For urology, residencies are five to six years, and then there are a lot of different fellowships. And, you know, I think that's what Zach appreciated during his rotation is there's so much more to urology, you know, than than the penis and, and even prostates. And, and so you can do a fellowship in kidney transplant and female urology and pediatric urology, like men's health, prosthetic urology, reconstruction, oncology, like so many different fellowships. And so... What I didn't realize at the time, but I realize now, which I think you and I spoke a little bit about before, was I was keeping my doors open. Mm-hmm. And and that's why I ended up just doing a fellowship. So, you know, we spend all this time, money, and resources during our training. And when we get to the end of whatever we are in that training and people say, what do you want to do? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah. we do what we're told for yeah. the most part. Yeah. And and so, yeah, despite all the years that we spend training, sometimes we just don't know how to answer that question. We're also watching a lot. So how do you know if you want to be a surgeon if you watch an eight-hour case? Like, I don't care who you are. And, and maybe I'm not a diehard surgeon like some others, but that's boring for anyone. Um, especially most of the time, if you're a student, you can't see what's going on for eight hours. And looking at skin or a colon for eight hours just is, it gets a little boring. <laughs> and How dare and, you? <laughs> and so until you're doing it, you just don't know, one, if you're going to like it, and two, if you're going to be good at it. But, you know, so all these specialties, a lot of them have fellowships. And so I decided uh, this was during my fourth year. So it was a five year program where I went and I was talking to one of my mentors who is maybe three years older than me. And he had done a fellowship, uh, the same fellowship, actually, that I did with the same uh, fellowship director. And he said, Amy, you have to be honest with yourself and you have to ask yourself the following question. What do you think it is? What do you think? What do you want to do when you grow up? No. Okay. What's in your heart? No, it's cheesy, but he said, how big is your ego? <laughs> <laughs> he said, do you want to be the person that people call up when they have a problem? When they, when, when they can't figure it out mm. or do you not want to be that person? And I was like, Caleb, my ego is huge. <laughs> <laughs> he had you pegged. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I know that's probably sounds that sounds pretty bad, but I love when when referring providers, I had one call me up, you know, two days ago at, at eight in the morning saying, what do you think about this? Like, how can we help this person? You know, and I like when other urologists refer patients to me because they don't know what else to do. I also like the bread and butter. Like, I like the gimmies. I need that in my clinic to make me feel good about the day and to help me move my clinic along. So I don't want a full day of complicated patients. Yeah. But I like the handful every clinic where I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a detective and we're gonna figure this out, you know. And if I don't know the answer, then I don't know. Let's do a trial, a clinical trial, and then we'll figure it out, you know. And that's how I get a lot of people to agree to do studies I do because I tell them I don't know what's going on, but I'm trying to figure it out. And and patients are, you know, they respond well to that. So I was keeping that door open because because of the question that Caleb had asked me. Mm-hmm. So then the question was, what fellowship are you going to do? And and my chairman at the time was like, well, do you want to do a medical fellowship? Like one that's more medical within urology or one that's more surgical within urology? And I mean, at the time, I wanted to do one that was more surgical. And so, you know, I mean, they're there's not a, a you know a strict line in between the two but reconstruction you know was a very surgical specialty and and the other question was do you want to do quantity of life surgery or quality of life surgery and and so a lot of the quantity of life things would be oncology and and i decided i want to be a quality of life surgeon and so when you you write the list of all the different types of fellowships and you narrow it down it's like okay i'm going to do a recon fellowship 
And, and the one that I decided, you know, to do is because of this, you know, close mentor of mine, he did a fellowship at this place and had great things to say. And so I knew I was going to get a good experience. Uh, and so I did that fellowship for a year. And, you know, there are some fellowships that are very uh, surgery focused. You're in the operating room a lot. There are ones that are very research focused. There are ones that are you're in clinic more. The one that I did, I was in clinic three days a week in the operating room two days a week. And I learned during my fellowship how to talk to patients. So despite, you know, four years of medical school, five years of, of surgery, residency and urology. And of course, I, I knew how to like talk to patients, but I really learned how to talk to patients in my year of fellowship. In a way that's different from if you just had just gone into practice. Yeah. In a way that's like you're in a good you're in the right place. Like I had a patient the other day in clinic, you know, who started crying. He was a 47 year old guy who starts crying in my office and he had seen multiple doctors before. And he said, I just feel that I'm in the right place. Hmm. And so I saw someone do that really well. And he would just sit down with patients and I, I mirror his same body positioning, <laughs> but he'll just go like this. And, and he would say, what else? What else? And that's what we learn in our provider communications class here, which a lot of faculty members have to do is we 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 were told, you know, to say that question. What else? Not do you have any questions? What questions do you have? Mm -hmm. And and that little phrase of the what else changed the way that I practice medicine. He did community webinars and I or, you know, in person seminars. So I saw how does one do that? I saw how does one educate a man on the basics of his body? Because when you do a surgery residency, you want to operate. You don't want to be in clinic. Like, did I, did I did I love being in clinic three days a week during my fellowship? No, I wanted to operate. But looking back, I learned so much from clinic. I learned how to run a men's health practice from my clinic. Mm -hmm. And, and so when I started at Iowa, I, I feel like I, I started off with skills that I wouldn't have learned from a lot of other fellowships. And the surgical skills, I continue to get better on. And, and if there's something I don't know how to do, again, I, I learn, I go somewhere and I learn how to do it. But I learned how to communicate in that one year. So what I didn't realize at the time was in each of these steps of when you have to make a decision out of necessity, I was making decisions that were keeping the greatest number of doors open. And you and I were discussing this the other day. I think we have to change the way that we ask students as we try to uh, give them mentorship on what careers to go into or what to apply for. And I think we have to stop asking them, what do you want to do? And ask them, what would you be upset that you couldn't do if you decided on that specialty? Because I'm still figuring out what I want to do, but I have a lot of doors that are still open. So if I want to be a businesswoman one day and a digital strategist the next day and a videographer one day and a researcher, a mentor, a teacher, an educator, men's health specialist, a transgender specialist, I can do all of those things. And being a urologist and being at Iowa allows me to do all those things, sometimes all in a single day, you know, but but if you are, you know, let's say you're deciding between dermatology and plastic surgery, then you have to consider what doors will be closed if you go one route versus another. So if you become a dermatologist, so th there are a lot of similarities between those two fields. And if you're thinking doing, you know, like let's say facial cosmetic type stuff, well, you could do that as a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon. Mm -hmm. But if you go the dermatology route, you're not gonna be in the operating room. Is that okay, yes or no? And if it's not okay, then you're gonna have to go the plastic surgery route. You can do most surgery and they can certainly do a lot in clinic when it comes to procedures, but you're not gonna be doing the big surgeries that plastics does. If you go into plastic surgery, you can still do all those other things, you know, that you might be able to do as a dermatologist. And and you maybe at one point in your career as a plastic surgeon, you can do all those big cases. And maybe as you get older, you say, I don't want to do all those big cases anymore. I want to do more of a cosmetic, you know, uh, procedural type clinic. You can do that. Same thing with urology. I do surgeries now, but when I'm older, maybe I just do want to see clinic patients and do procedures in the office. And I can do that. The question becomes, can you do that as a cardiothoracic surgeon? Can you can you tone it down? Less so. I, I I don't know if you if you can because they operate right. So what is their? You you don't become a cardiologist if you no longer want to do surgery as a cardiothoracic surgeon. Oh, as a general surgeon, what would you do if you wanted to not do surgery anymore? I, I don't think you yeah. can run a clinic of abscesses. You know. So the question is, do you want to leave that option open of managing patients in clinic? With the caveat that I'll tell you, a lot of people going to surgery don't want to do clinic. So that would be okay with a lot of surgeons. 
like I I like clinic, but I don't want to do clinic a lot. I don't always want to be in clinic. I don't always want to be in the operating room and I don't always want to do research. That's why I'm happy as a urologist. But some people always want to be in the OR, so then they shouldn't be a urologist. Mm. So I think it's more so what can't you do if you make the decision? I think another good example is between like a physician assistant and like a medical doctor. So, you know, I'll finish a clinic on a Wednesday and if I have a PA student rotating with me, I'll say, Sandy, this could all be yours. You could have all of this. And they're like, no, thank you. (laughs) You know? Interesting. And so they can, they could really see any of the patients that I see and do any of the in-office procedures that I do. The real, the difference is they can't be a primary surgeon in the operating room. Depending on the practice they join, they might be able to be a first assist, but they will never be the primary surgeon. So if that is okay with that person, they shouldn't go into $200,000 of debt and and go through all that extra training if if they don't need those extra things, you know? But if they say, "No, I want to I want to be able to make those game time surgical decisions and be the primary surgeon," then that requires $200,000 of debt perhaps and additional training. When you mentioned your work with transgender people, what would you tell a student that's uncomfortable with that on a philosophical level? Mm. I would say you have to get comfortable. You just have to figure it out because it's not even, you know, I I care for a transgender patient and and they show up in my clinic, but that's because they're interested in bottom surgery. But those patients have hearts and they have lungs and they get sore throats and they, you know, get ankle fractures. And so they will show up in everyone's clinic. And uh, and so just like we teach cultural uh, competency and humility with anybody who is different than ourselves, than our transgender patient population, they're just someone else that might identify as being different than us. What I love about what I do is I'm a cisgendered woman and I direct our men's health program. And there, in so many ways, I'm so different from so many of the patients that I see in my office. And, and yet I advocate for all of them. And so I think there's power in advocating for people who are similar to you. And there's just as much power to advocate for people who are very different from oneself. Mm-hmm. I'm still getting hung, hung up on this young, healthy guys with low testosterone. What does that look like? And what can guys do? Uh, I'm, oh. as, I'm asking for a friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> not me, not me. Someone else. <laughs> So I see athletes in my office. I see the pictures of health in my office that most people would look at them and be like, that guy has a good life and he's in my office, you know, which makes me wonder about when I I live like in downtown Iowa City, I see all the undergrads and I'm like, holy shit, how many people have these questions? They just don't know where to go. You know, like on the, you know, student health site and not just, you know, particular to our university, but others. It's like when you go to what services are provided for women and it's a lot of services and the service that are what are the services provided for men, like for male specific health concerns, domestic violence training and STI testing. And there is Mm -hmm. so much more to men's health than those two things. And so what I've learned in the last three years is that because I thought growing up, woe is me as a woman. It's really hard. And I've learned, holy shit, woe is everyone. Everyone <laughs> is struggling or can be struggling at a certain time in their lives. And men ask really good questions, but but they never get plugged into the healthcare system. We get plugged in. We're lucky. Right. Because our like my mom was like, Amy, you're 17 years old. You got to get your ass to a gynecologist. And I'm like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> but I had to, you know? And so you have someone to vet questions by if you need to. Or if we have children, then we see a doctor. And so we have another opportunity to ask questions. What's the milestone in your life that says, Zach, you got to see a doctor? If you can't pee at 50. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're like, there is no <laughs> milestone. So you come in when you have symptoms, when you could have prevented some of those things years earlier. So the common symptoms that I see for guys coming in with low T are, I call it like the tail of the middle-aged male. It's what all of us think is- Hang on, I gotta gotta prepare myself. (laughs) (laughs) It is the guy who comes home from work who sits down on the couch and plays video games. And let's let's say just in a heterosexual couple situation, the wife is like, can you help cook dinner or can you like help with the kid or take the dog for a walk? And that guy's like, I'm tired, you know? And, and he wonders like, you know, I used like, he's working out at the gym. He's going a few days a week, but he's, he's finding it hard to lose five pounds. 
it wasn't hard five years ago. Like he could just change his nutrition a little bit, work out a little bit and drop the weight. And now he's struggling to get the five pounds off. And he actually cares about how he looks. We think women only care about how we look. Men care about how they look too. And in mm-hmm. fact, the marketing research shows that a lot of men who go to med, people who go to med spas are men. So they care about those things. And then let's see. So, so he's not seeing progress in the gym. So it's hard to stay motivated. And then his sex drive is a little bit down, but he thinks that all men are supposed to be, you know, wanting sex all the time. And so his partner thinks that he isn't attracted to her anymore, you know, because he just like isn't initiating like he was. And his erections just like aren't quite what they were before. So he notices changes in his body and like his motivation, his pep in his step. People describe like a brain fog. And so so that guy, unfortunately, what's his diagnosis? Sleep apnea. Different. What's his differential sleep? Okay, sleep apnea. Yeah. Vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency. Thyroid issues. Okay. So, so we check all those things. So, so let's say, so he doesn't snore. Let's say we get an at-home sleep. So a lot of these guys, I, I agree with you. You're, you're right on it. Uh, so many of these guys have sleep apnea. But let's say he doesn't have sleep apnea. And he doesn't have diabetes. He doesn't have a thyroid issue. What's his diagnosis? Low T. Yeah. I don't know where else to go. Yeah. And, and so and a lot of people will, won't check his testosterone because the guy has a beard. So they're like, you don't have low T. You have a beard. <laughs> Oh, interesting. And he has muscles, too, because he works out. And they're like, you you have biceps. You don't have low T. So they won't check his T, actually. So his diagnosis is, I'm 35 years old, and I want to live my best life. And I'm trying to figure out if it's just due to age, but I'm struggling. He does not fit in our medical system. He doesn't have diabetes. He doesn't have high blood pressure. He has no diagnosis. He just wants to do better and be better. And And that is the unfortunate part. And so, you know, even if these things are common with, with age, the reality, but can we do something about it? I had clinic, you know, this weekend, a med student came out and it was like the same person verbalizing all these concerns. And, and I was like, what do you think is going on? And she was like, I think he's getting older. And I was like, but can we do something about it? Because we can do something about diabetes and we can do something about high blood pressure. Can we do something for this, you know, guy in it thir- who's 35? And we can. And, and the research shows, so one, we should check his testosterone because a lot of those guys actually do have low testosterone. But we can also talk to him about the importance of exercise and nutrition. And, and a lot of people know those things are important, but they need tangible advice. And, and with all this misinformation out there, he's like, he'll ask like, but what, so what do I eat? Do I do intermittent fasting? Do I do small meals all throughout the day? Do I do keto? Do I do gluten-free? And, and that can be a very simple and a very complex conversation. The, the real answer is, do you look the way you want to look and do you feel the way that you want to feel? And if the answer to either of those is no, then you have to change what you're doing. So the, then the, the next question is, so then what do you do? Pay attention to your body. Your body tells you. You know, so my sister's a gastroenterologist. She does medical weight management at the University of Miami. So a lot of my conversation comes from what she's taught me. And, and so, you know, keto is not for everyone and gluten-free is not for everyone. So like if you, so she'll have patients come in who will eat like a full pizza and they'll say, there's something wrong with me. I feel like really bloated and I get like constipation after I eat a full pizza. What's wrong with me? And she's like, your body is reacting normally to eating shit. <laughs> there is nothing you wrong with you. ate a pizza. That's and so wrong. And so yeah. we ask what's wrong with me, what's wrong with you. We don't say what's wrong with the food we're putting in our mouths. Yes. Yeah. And so we just have to pay attention. It's the same conversation I have with my patients who drink coffee and they wonder why they pee all day. And you ask them like, oh, uh, what do you drink during the day? And they say, oh, some water. So I don't ask it like that. I'm like, how much coffee? How much tea? How much? I assume everything. And if they say, oh, I, I drink a cup of coffee in the morning. How big is the cup? A cup or a cup? And you and then so usually they're like, oh, I drink a pot of coffee in the morning. Okay. So I'm like, okay, well, if you're coming in to see me because you pee throughout the day and you drink coffee in the morning, I, I know like this is not a sexy conversation to talk about. You you're not going to hear what I have, like what I have to say, but coffee is a known trigger to the bladder. So let's start there with behavioral modification. And, and a lot of guys, they just haven't been told that before. So they had no concept, but if you ask them, they'll be like, oh yeah, I do pee a lot after I drink coffee in the morning. And so it's, it's, if I do this, do I feel better? Do I feel worse? And if I feel worse, you just can't do it. And you have to change those habits. 
but sleep is important and stress is important and getting to a healthy weight is important and exercise is important. And and the myth of, of eating uh, tofu and, and soy products and lowering testosterone, that's false. And there's no evidence to say that. So eat your tofu. But yeah, like all the things that don't perhaps cost money and can save us money, but aren't medications will help boost testosterone levels. And some people are really open to that information because they don't want to be on medications. And other people are like, just give me a medication. But that those behaviors start when people are children. And and so, you know, we can treat the testosterone when people are older, but you got to reverse perhaps decades of poor habits. That's what my sister sees in one of her challenges in the office is guys come in in their 70s who are overweight. They want to lose weight. She has to figure out how to figure out exactly what they're eating and to change the way that they've had interacted with food over 70 years. And what they thought was healthy and what their mother told them they were feeding them for breakfast because this is going to help you develop into a strong young boy was actually not good for them. And that can be a very sensitive thing to talk about. Yeah, you're messing with you're messing with mama there. Yeah. I mean, you're touching on identity, too. We talk about that a lot on the show, identity and how I've never seen people react with more hostility than when you threaten their identity Mm -hmm. or like a pillar of their identity. So. That's interesting. It's a hard conversation. So we can test for the testosterone and and that's an easy thing to do. And there are some providers who are very open to that and others that just say, we'll work out and, you know, eat less and get some better sleep. But it's really hard to do all those things when your testosterone level is low. It's a kind of like a feedback yeah. on itself. Yeah. And so a lot of these guys who have low T, like they want to do better, but they're just having a hard time. So my approach is you treat everything. You treat their sleep apnea, you treat their diabetes, you know, you talk about nutrition, exercise, and you treat their testosterone. And more and more research is coming out now to say that treating the testosterone improves waist circumference and and blood pressure and glycemic control. And so if if people are going up on their insulin, we're not treating their testosterone. It's like, well, we need to treat all of these things and our patients, they'll they'll have optimal outcomes. Well, look, Dr. Amy Perlman, I got to close the show out. No. (laughs) <laughs> but it was super nice having you here. Thank you for being on the show today to talk about your your work. It's been great to hear from you. Yeah, it's been an honor, a privilege. I feel like as I'm closing out on my, my I had a three-year contract, and I feel like this is like if I made it on the podcast, <laughs> this is closing out my three years. Holy and crap. I feel like I need, I'm going to, this is going to be the next thing I add to my CV. <laughs> I mean, be, be a regular. We'd love to have you back. Seriously. Yeah. Honestly. We talked about it. I, when we talked about it, I was like, how has she not been on this show before? It's bonkers. So I'm making a series. <laughs> AJ, Aline, Zach, Jason, thanks for being on the show today with us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having us. Thanks, thanks for pleasure. Coleman. And what kind of tours to testicle would I be if I didn't thank you, Short Coats, for making us a part of your week? If you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available. Our editors are A.J. Chowdhury and Eric Bozart. Alex Belzer is our marketing coordinator. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler saying don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too.